Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Quantum Information Science, um, Physics 116. Uh, the web page is below. Uh, and today's lecture will be about quantum theory, our first look at quantum theory proper. This is our first look at quantum theory. We spent the first week looking at probability theory. We looked at various aspects of kinematics. And um, just to give a little outline for today, we're gonna take some time to do logistics. In particular, we're gonna look at the referee report um, that'll be due at the end of this week. Um, there's a Jupyter notebook that's been posted to go along with our kinematics of the bit. And tomorrow is our lab. Um, so we're gonna start after that, we'll go into a review of the last lecture We'll talk about quantum states, terminology, notation. We'll get some discussion of measurement um, and how we can bootstrap from our understanding of probability. That will also give us a chance to introduce sharp probability vectors, which could have been introduced earlier, but um, this is uh, something that we'd like to introduce for the sake of sharpening the way that you can understand what a wave function is. Uh, and then we'll end today's lecture with wave functions and the change of basis formulas. So that's our plan. Um, and just to kick off, um, the first thing I would like to highlight is the referee reports. The referee reports are, um, are gonna be due at the end of this week. And let's see, I have um, a bit of guidance that's been posted to the webpage. Um, this is uh, the guidance to referees. Here we're just talking about what our expectations are. Expectations are gonna be around physical review letters. So we want you to give out constructive feedback. So it's very important. This class is about being professional, and um, you know, being being professional includes doing professional um, obligations like referee reports. And so this is a short referee report for a short abstract, three hundred words, and just give some feedback. Try and help out your colleagues. Try and provide some insights. If you don't understand anything of it, have a look at some of the references. You know, maybe look at the first page or see if anything's super clear. And if you don't get much out of it, then feel free to write down and say your report, I didn't get much out of this. It's very hard for me to understand what you've written. These are your peers. So they should be communicating to you as a peer. So if you don't understand anything, then it's not great for, for them as a writer and that's good feedback to give. There's also a link here to um, uh, some guidance about how to write a report from Nature Chemistry. So there's a little bit of guidance. It doesn't need particularly long, but we'd like it to be constructive and uh, it'd be not, follow general guidance for referees. So I urge you to look at the physical review um, reference, guidance referees and you'll see that it mirrors very much what's um, inside of our journal guidance. So please um, participate in that. I, I'd be excited to see what you guys think and what you guys have to feed, uh, to get feedback between each other. Um, us as the teaching staff, um, me and my AJ, will be looking at all of the assignments, we'll be, uh, all of the, submitted abstracts as well as all the referee reports and giving guidance to both referees and to writers. So hopefully this is a good test experience for how professional science is conducted. Um, okay, the second thing that I wanted to announce at uh, the start of class um, is that the last time we went through the kinematics of the bit, we'll review that momentarily, but on the website there is a PDF that has the kinematics of the bit where we've implemented all the main concepts that we discussed using uh, NumPy. And uh, we'll eventually move on to using um, Rocket as well. And that'll be in tomorrow's lab. Tomorrow's lab will start at 120 and um, it'll go until 220. And uh, that lab will be designed around this notion of measuring a bit and measuring the qubit. And we'll have a number of exercises that require you to think a bit mathematically, think a bit in terms of how you can understand what's being measured and hopefully build from there and help build up uh, some of your programmatic uh, understanding and also help you learn a little bit of Python along the way. And so the lab should take about an hour, um, that's the design, and we'll be looking for feedback from uh, how it helps your learning and things like that when we get there. Okay, so last time, just to recap where we were, we were talking, we ended our discussion of probability. And just to remind, the discussion of probability went along the lines of constraints, interpretation, and this was uh, the constraints interpretations for the kinematics of the bit. From there, we talked about the change of basis. For the bit, it was just a bit flip or the X gate, as you might like. 
a stochastic change of basis. And this is much more interesting in terms of probability theory. And then we also had the general stochastic transformations and we generalize that to uh, continuous transformations using the uh, transition rate matrix rather than the probability transition matrix. And then you could, we discussed that you could um, exponentiate that, that equation for the differential equation and get out some parameterization of uh, M. Okay, so now with that in hand, what we're going to do is now turn towards quantum. There's one last thing I'd like to introduce before we go to quantum, and that's the notion of a sharp of a sharp probability density, uh, yeah, probability density vector. It actually took me quite a bit of time to think about what um, term we should be using for this, and I came up with sharp because I think this this conveys a lot of the notions that we want to get across. Um, calling it a, a non-probabilistic event is not very uh, sensible. So there's a lot of things that didn't make sense. So we want to think of this as a probability vector that's concentrated. There's a lot of different ways you could say the same thing. But we're going to think of it in the following way. Think of this inside of the basis of discourse we've been using so far, which is just this ej hat basis. Sum over j, and there's a delta function here. It's delta function 0 unless i is equal to j. So this just selects one event. And yes, we could use the notation EI, but I think the, the stress here is that we want to stress that this is a probability density vector. But a simple one. So it's a simple one that just has a one and all zeros. This would have been nice to introduce um, in one of the lectures. We had a question about how do you remember the normalization condition on the Markov transition matrices. You can remember because if you apply this uh, this uh, sharp probability density vector to one of the um, transition matrices, you're just going to pull out one of the columns. When you pull out that column, it should be a valid, a valid probability density vector so that this transforms valid probability density vectors to valid probability density vectors. So that means every row, every column has to be a probability density vector. This is actually going to generalize very nicely to a our wave function discussion, which we'll have to introduce later just to connect to standard pedagogy. Uh, but yeah, this is a useful state in of itself. And so this is more notation than anything else, notation and terminology. So this is how we'll, we'll term this inside of our lecture series, um, sharp probability distributions. We'll denote it this way. Okay. So what are we gonna do today? What we're gonna do today is turn towards quantum theory. We're gonna turn towards quantum theory in a very particular way we're going to try and understand all the things that we've taken from probability theory to understand quantum theory. I think as, as a high level picture of what's going on, just recall that what we're doing, starting with probability first, and then we're transitioning with probability theory to quantum theory. Uh, there's a couple of reasons that we're doing this. If you don't like the argument that quantum theory is a uh, natural extension of probability, which it is. Um, you can also remember that probability will be our entry point to information theory. So if we wanna study quantum information science, starting from probability is gonna give us a very nice access point to understand both quantum and probability theory. In order to understand these things, I think in a, in a sophisticated way that will put you at the forefront of thought and, and, and capabilities as far as how to utilize that knowledge, the notion of starting from probability first hopefully helps enhance your ability to do quantum information science. The first thing we want to um, bring up is this notion of a quantum lift. This notion of a quantum lift is that we're going to take our probability vectors and lift them directly to quantum states. We listen to quantum states by just taking a vector and rearranging it along the diagonal of a matrix. There's a very common operation set of many programming languages called diag. So the diag of a vector gives back a matrix with those entries along the diagonal. Conversely, in many languages, if you do diag on a matrix, it just returns the diagonal of that matrix. And we'll see that operation plays very well for us going to quantum as well as coming back from quantum to understand probability theory. Just to remind ourselves uh, from the beginning, we have this notion of 
a probability state and a quantum state. And these have uh, properties that are in basically one-to-one -one correspondence. So we have here the normalization condition that shows up in both the quantum and uh, probabilistic case. So one word of note here, this is the trace norm. There are several other norms that will be denoted with the one. And we'll talk about norms in a more um, complete discussion a little bit later. Uh, the reality condition that the entries of the probability vector need to be real numbers and that the eigenvalues, the density matrix need to be real. We also assume that the entries of the probability distribution are greater than or equal to zero. We assume the same thing by assuming that this matrix is positive semi-definite for all the elements. So with that in hand, we can define a few terms that are important for us, uh, or not important for us, but the few terms that will be important for just understanding the literature and understanding the terminology that's used inside of quantum theory. The probability states um, have the normalization condition in these blue boxes along the diagonal of our density matrix, our probability density matrix will also form a valid probability state. The coherence is the off diagonal are complex numbers that really are there to enforce the conditions on the probability density vector. And they can only be there as long as they satisfy those conditions. Just as a word of note, our quantum lift of a probability vector where we just put everything along the diagonal. Well, the diagonal should sum to one because the probability distribution was uh, normalized. It's all greater than or equal to zero because again, the probability distribution was uh, positive and that it's real, it satisfies this condition. All the, all the values of the probability function. Also because it's diagonal, this condition is also satisfied. So the next point that I'd like to bring up um, in, in opening our discussion of quantum theory before we get into interpretation or anything of that sort, let's recall what is an eigenbasis. And so by definition of how we define the quantum states, we've implicitly assumed that an eigenbasis exists. And for the purposes of organizing notation and uh, our thoughts about this, we will denote our eigenbasis with the same notation we used for our probability basis vectors for our initial probability discussion. But now we'll, we'll give it a new de denotation as these pi hats. This pi hat basis will be the eigenbasis of a probability density vector that we're discussing. This uh, eigenbasis, of course, exists for matrices that are normal. That is a matrix that um, A commutes with A dagger. In any case, the eigenbasis is assumed to exist because our matrix is square. We assume the eigenvalues have certain properties, which means it must have eigenvalues. You can be a little more um, mathematically sophisticated and extend it to other things where this is starts to become a little more mathematically complicated and interesting if instead of a discrete space, we're dealing with a continuous space. But nonetheless, the idea is uh, still the same. This is the eigenbasis and the eigenvalues are going to be denoted in this particular way. And the interesting, or uh, interesting, but one terminology that shows up is this is also called the natural basis. And these are called the populations sometimes. So this is the natural basis. These are populations or natural occupation numbers. There's a number of other names, but the idea still the same, it's describing the eigenvalues of this uh, probability density vector. The right way to think about what's happening inside of this eigenbasis is that um, NJ is forming a probability distribution over the states pi. A state, let's say, to a little more consistent with terminology, measuring outcome 
corresponding to pi j. So, um, right. Okay, so with the eigenbasis here, the interesting thing is that this is the eigenbasis. In this eigenbasis, our density matrix is always diagonal. So this is rho is equal to So the interesting thing about operators and the notion of operators versus um, versus the matrix itself is directly in the fact that we can write down this object, this object rho, without talking about the basis that it's written in. But if you write it down on a basis, then we also need to include what basis we're talking about. So the operator is the matrix defined with respect to any basis, and the matrix is a particular representation of an operator inside a particular basis. So in general, this is not the case that it's diagonal, but one of the nice things is that when it is diagonal, we actually get a lot of information about this state that we can, uh, we can understand and discuss. And so we will do so next. Let me sort out my notes here one second. Okay. Yes. So we have our states here. Uh, and I think the next thing that we want to discuss just a bit about um, yes, we have structures, we have diagonal matrices. So, yeah, one, one thing that would be nice to point out here is that this does form a probability vector, a probability vector P in this case. It's going to be defined such that pi j hat is equal to n j. This is a valid probability distribution, probability density vector. We'll call it p sub n just to indicate that it's from the eigenbasis. So this is the main things I want to say about the eigenbasis. The eigenbasis always exists, uh, and this is whatever dimensions you want to think of. Um, if we have a diagonal matrix, so say some probability distribution that's been lifted, we'll denote these diagonal matrices as P, and this is just P1, P2, P10. So we can think this eigenbasis is also equal to lambda Let's just stick with our diagonal matrix notation here. So this diagonal matrix notation here um, should hopefully be impressed upon you that this diagonal matrix and the probability vector that it's lifted from, let's change the color here just to make sure it's clear. The lifted probability state, probability density vector, lifted probability vector is a valid probability density vector, a matrix, but it's in the eigenbasis. P is equal to sum over Pj 
ej hat, then that means that lambda p is equal to the sum over pj ej hat, ej hat. So this is already in its eigenbasis, and this is the eigenbasis, whatever the probability vector was given as. So this is how you think of the quantum lift. So you think of the eigenbasis, and the eigenbasis, our probability density vector, probability density matrix, is exactly a probability vector that's been lifted. Now, turning towards measurement and decoherence, uh, measurement and interpretation, excuse me, the first thing I want to highlight, and we'll use purple to, to highlight this point, is it because we can lift all of our probability vectors to diagonal probability density vector and matrices, um, we can actually interpret these things conceptually exactly the same. So in this class, we'll assume this is interpreted exactly the same as the vector. So conceptually. The only difference is they're organized that they're organized differently. So the, the probability of realizing an outcome, the how to update the state, you know, uh, is it interpreted as a real thing or is it a representation of our knowledge? All these things carry forward. Just carry forward the full discussion um, of P. So the probability vector. So um, that's, that's, in some sense, all we want to say about measurement interpretation. However, that's not enough for us to give a full picture. And I think one of the questions that might show up uh, as, as, a, as a question that's particularly valid is how do we actually get rid of the coherences? What, is the, what are the coherences looking for us? And so for that, we're going to move on to another color, and we'll say two things about that. I'd like to say something about decoherent maps. Their transformations. It's decoherent transformation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, also known as a channel. All meaning the same thing. These are all just terms for the same thing. Uh, and the second thing I'd like to discuss uh, interpretation and uh, measurement is the wave function. So we haven't said anything about wave functions yet. And so I'll say a few words about what a wave function is. Uh, but first, let us think about this decoherent map. The decoherent map um, is, is our first example of a stochastic transformation that we can perform on a probability density matrix. So we're going to take the same definition we had of stochastic transformations. Stochastic transformation is any transformation that transforms uh, a valid probability density matrix to a probability, valid probability density matrix. Okay, so we have some transformation. We'll denote it quite standard terminology with this cursive E. Um, this cursive E, in our case, we're going to do E, and we'll give this one a particular uh, value. We'll give some uh, basis in which it is decohering. And what decoherence is, as a word, is the loss of coherences. The coherences are off diagonal elements of a probability density matrix. If we want to get rid of all the off-diagonal elements, we can do this projective measurement, also known as the coherent map. And what happens here is this is not quite the same as projective measurement. It's a little bit different. Here, we're not going to think about this projective measurement as actually measuring anything. That's a bit misleading in terms of what this map is. This map is not the actual act of measurement. The act of measurement is realizing an outcome of a probability distribution. Instead, what this is, is transforming a valid density matrix into 
a valid diagonal density matrix, which then can be interpreted entirely as we've highlighted already as some um, conceptually the same as an ordinary probability distribution. Uh, so, yeah. So now we can rearrange this a little bit just using our knowledge of bracket notation. And for EJ, rho, EJ, EJ. This in parentheses is just one term. This one term that we've put here is now just the probability that appears along the diagonal of this rho prime. Now rho prime has no coherences, no off diagonal elements to speak of. Um, all these terms are diagonal elements. And so we don't see any off diagonal elements. And so this has lost all of its coherence or decohered. So that's where the origin of the terminology comes from. It's also a projective map, which is interesting to think about. If we do E, E hat squared is equal to E, E. Additionally, this here, PJ, squared is also equal to pj. So we have the use of a couple of different types of projectors. These are the projector conditions. This is our first example of a stochastic transformation. Decoherent map. The second thing I want to highlight here is where wave functions fit into this whole picture, this whole discussion we've had so far. I really haven't said too much about it. I've not even mentioned them. And I think it's a little, um, let's say shocking, perhaps not the word, word but it's a little against expectations if you thought this was gonna be uh, another copy of Nielsen and Chuang. Instead, what we're gonna do is, as we said, follow this notion of starting with probability, we went through a lot of kinematics of probability, and then we're gonna go through the same kinematics of the probability density matrix. So where does wave functions fit into this discussion? And so this is where we'll take a small digression and talk about interpretations of when the wave function picture is appropriate. So we'll mark off a little bit of space here. Don't want to belabor the point about wave functions. So I won't, but I will try to give a clear explanation as to where and when they enter into this picture. So these functions that I mentioned, these sharp probability functions, when these get boosted under the quantum lift or get lifted to the quantum state, this is going to be some state that has zeros everywhere, except for one, one, in the jth entry. So this one goes here. This is called a lot of different names, but for this in quantum theory, this is what we call a pure state. And we can actually measure the purity in a number of different ways. Um, if we take the trace of rho squared. This is not one unless the state's pure. So this gives some measure of purity. There are many other measures of purity. Um, and if the state is pure, if rho is pure, then what are the consequences? We can write down rho inside its eigenbasis. So we have rho is equal to sum over nj pi j, pi j, let's use another letter. K, K, K. And in j, if we assume that this came from a probability, a probability um, vector, then what will remain is just the j inside, the, inside that column. So we'll just end up with pi j, 
So now at this point, we have more information than we really need. And so what happens at this point, and this is where you have to be a little careful about the notation that we're using here. So then we only need to keep half of the information. This is too much information for us. So row itself can be stored as just a single state. And this is normally denoted as psi. The conditions on psi that you normally know, the, the probability being the norm squared follows directly from the use of psi as a pure probability density matrix. Um, you can also, the, all the other properties and normalization conditions, everything about wave functions that you may have learned elsewhere, or you may have seen elsewhere, all apply to the case that this state is completely pure. There's no mixture here over probability, uh, over probabilities of different states. So it's a very particular case. And it's worth pointing out that um, this approach that we've taken to start with probability first allowed us to avoid talking about energy. Energy is a very interesting concept, but energy is a very difficult concept that, um, that can often confound new uh, you know, beginners in physics. And it's, it's not a simple discussion. When we teach introductory physics, we don't jump into energy. Even when you think most introductory classes um, in the mathematical and physical sciences, when there's a discussion of energy, it takes a while to develop. Energy is a very important aspect of understanding physics because it's a symmetry. And symmetries play a very important role, uh, but that symmetry is usually not around. So the conservation of energy is a very rare thing to actually see on uh, everyday life scale. So of course, conservation of energy is important. You can't destroy energy, and that's certainly true, but energy is very hard to understand where it's been sequestered. So when we think about the energy of the planet Earth moving around the sun, that also includes all the energy of all the animals eating on the planet, includes the energy of the rotation of the Earth, the rotation of the, Earth, of the Earth's orbit, it includes a lot of different aspects of energy that are very hard to uh, conceptually disentangle. It makes it very difficult to think about energy because it is a scalar. So in any case, a lot of things about energy that are very interesting and very deep. Um, but we didn't use energy as a basis for our discussion. Uh, it, it, secondly, if we use energy as a basis for a discussion, in most real life situations on Earth, we're quite often in places that are hot, we're doing um, quantum experiments where we don't have perfect control over the state, we're doing uh, quantum experiments where we don't have perfect control over the gates that were applied to the state. And so all these different things that can happen as we go and manipulate states or otherwise measure states, try and learn them, this is where we're going to naturally have the quantum uh, density matrix, probability density matrix point of view in hand. Only when the state's pure can you use a wave function. Just to highlight that one more time. So it's pure. Oops. Um, then we can do this. So now the next thing I would like to uh, talk about, uh, let me also give, there were a few questions I got asked in class, but hopefully this makes sense. The notes hopefully help as well. Um, I think it might be useful to give an example of a decoherent map, but uh, I should be able to find one inside the notes. Okay, so um, we are gonna ro keep rolling. Next thing we wanna talk about is the change of basis formula. Our change of basis formulas that we had before, we we're discussing probability theory. The only change of basis that we allowed was changing the basis using a permutation. Okay, so we had some permutation from the permutation group that just transformed the state. And when we think about what happens if we um, lift our state to some density matrix row, give us another color, maybe green. So now we lift this quantum state, we can try and see if we can realize the same operation on the probability density 
matrix. Okay, so if we actually apply this, the amazing thing is, is that the outcome, not particularly amazing, this is a relatively easy exercise to show that this is true. And there's an example inside the text where um, you will see this done for a running example. Let's see if I can write it down. Yeah. P one three two. Oh, I won't write an example. It'll take quite a bit of time. But the idea is that we just multiply out these matrices. You can actually see that this works out. It's not too hard to see this has to be the case. And in fact, we can we can uncover this by looking at how we write down uh, this uh, probability density, uh, this um, permutation matrix. The permutation matrix is E sigma J. We defined sigma last time or earlier. So this is our permutation matrix. Permutation matrix has some interesting things that I'd like you to know. So first thing I would like to highlight is that this basis EJ and this permuted basis of EJ are both orthonormal. And so what we have here is some transformation of one orthonormal set to another orthonormal set. We can in fact take this, and this is enough for us to actually prove the statement. So we do sum over J, E sigma J, J lambda P, K, Sigma K over J and K. This just gives back P J Delta J K. Then we're left with E Sigma J E Sigma K. Us over a little bit, give ourselves some space. Okay. So sum over everything, sum over J and K, these behind just PJ, sum over J, E sigma J, e sigma J. We see that the probability J, PJ, has been moved to the event sigma J. So this is just a nice illustration of how to change the basis and a new type of notation. Okay. Nothing too fancy we've done. And then we want to think about how we can generalize this. So the generalization of this, and this is where we get into some interesting physics that you will probably have seen elsewhere. And we'll arrive to it now. And this is the notion of a unitary transform. So those of you who've seen quantum information science before will have seen unitary transforms. What a unitary transform is, is effectively just a change of basis formula. That's one way to think of it. And the way that we're gonna write it down, we'll just think that we have some other basis besides E, we'll call it F. And then we just convert from E to F. So this F is no longer just a permutation of the basis E, but this is still an orthonormal basis. So this is orthonormal and this is orthonormal. So we're just transforming from one orthonormal basis to another. And this is what it means to be a unitary transform. So we want EJ, and FJ to be orthonormal. Then use unitary, and that will imply 
that you inverse equals to u dagger, or that u u dagger is equal to the identity. This is uh, the property that it's unitary. All right, a few other properties to follow from unitarity um, that this is also something that doesn't change the two norm. Um, so it's actually interesting to think about what that means. Uh, so I will say just a little bit about it. If we have a two norm of a vector, we'll use vector notation here because I don't want to, um, I don't want to give this added importance. Two norm is sum over x, j, absolute value squared, square root of the whole thing, sum over j. Um, U is considered an isometry with respect to the two norm, the L two norm. So with respect to this basis, or no, this basis, sorry, with respect to this norm, the two norm, unitary rotation is a rotation. Doesn't change the length of the vector. Change the L2 length. Okay, but we have purposely not taught our course using the L2 um, norm. This is the wrong way to think of quantum mechanics, and uh, this is my course, so we're going to be indoctrinating people as I see fit, which is with this probability first use of the quantum density matrix formulation. Okay. So, yeah, change of basis. Um, Yeah, so how do we change the basis in the case that we want to do something interesting, right? So in the case that we wanted to change our basis in ordinary probability, well, we had to lift. When we lifted, we had to act on both the left and the right in order to apply this permutation matrix appropriately to transform our diagonal probability density matrices correctly. So just as a matter of form, we can just copy the form. Let's write down u and just see if it works. So then we're going to work this out a little bit, um, not a little bit, work it out with this um, example that we have here in purple. Sum over j, do fj, ej, put a k here, sum over k, ej. Put in our diagonal probability density vector here. And then let's see what we get out of it. So first we're going to get out a probability pj, and then fj, fj. And that's where we've taken this to here. Okay. That's not clear. Hopefully it is. So that's how we're getting the probability out front. Um, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. This should be okay. This gives PJ delta JK from here. We left behind the states FJ and FK. Summing over, we sum over just the J, PJ, FJ, FJ. And you can see. What's happened from our probability density matrix before is that we had the sum over 
PJ, EJ, EJ, and then we acted with this unitary transformation U on both sides. And we ended up with something that's just the same probability density matrix, uh, probability density uh, vector underlying. However, however, it's just in a new basis. So we went from this expression with the E basis to this expression with the F basis. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of the lecture. So just one last thing I'd like to say, and this is really in preparation for um, tomorrow's lab. Oh, actually, one more thing I'll add before that. It's just to, to highlight this, this notion of wave functions. I didn't say uh, enough about this, and we'll continue about this a uh, bit more on, uh, on Wednesday, uh, that if we have some way of doing time evolution, uh, U of t, and this U of t is advancing some wave function, this is how you quite often see uh, many standard treatments that begin with wave function. We start off with some unitary transformation of a wave function to get another wave function. And again, we're going to assume that if the wave function is actually a single event with probability one, then we can write it down in the following form. We act with unitary on both sides. You can see that this unitary uh, not splits up, but rather can act from the left and right following the rules of uh, the complex conjugate, the transpose. The conjugate transpose, and then what you see that we get back f psi f and psi f, and so actually using this probability density formalism is uh, not overkill, but it's you carry around too much information. In fact, you don't need this much information. You can press the state quite easily by just keeping track of just one state rather than a whole matrix. And that state, however, is not a valid probability state. It is uh, considered a wave function. Uh, just a word of note, there's no way that we can call this a wave vector. Wave vector is a term reserved for something else. So this is also not a function. So there's a little bit of uh, funky terminology there. This is properly a vector for this discrete case. Okay. So now just to say a little bit more, I'm going to say something about active versus passive transformations. This will be in preparation for um, for the lab tomorrow, where we're going to think about how to do measurement of a given state, and we're going to have to rotate the basis of measurement. So let's think about active versus passive. So in a prior context, we talked about a passive transformation just being a relabeling, reorganization, some notational change. It doesn't actually require us to change anything in the physical world. You just passively change your outlook, or you actively address the situation and change things. And so we can write this down mathematically, I think perhaps easier than we can inside the example of, uh, of probability where we had this nice physical example of the Monty game where someone could rotate the cups using their hands, some operator applying some, some hustler applying actual operations to these swapping gates, or we could just talk about it differently. We're going to relabel states from left to right, from right to left. It's a guessing game of which cup is labeled one which cups labeled A. And so if you just change the names of things, that's very much like the permutation idea. And so we're gonna think about um, quantum states and their probabilities. So let's, let's start off with some quantum density matrix here. We're gonna think about inside of some basis M hat. And so if we wanna know what this probability is, this is some probability PM. Okay, whatever M might be. And we can transform this in a number of different ways. And the ways that I'd like to impress upon you as interesting for the sake of our discussion here uh, of what is active and what is passive. Transform the state. And we're gonna use a uh, unitary transform. So we'll use U active and we'll use two colors. Let's, uh, let's pick, um, Pick blue for active. And then we'll pick red for passive. And we're going to do this in a very particular way. And let me make sure I get all of my indices correct. I'm going to give this lecture in class. I, I 
put it down too quickly. It didn't come out as cleanly as I would have liked. So I'm gonna do you not the right color of red. Nice dark red. You pass it. Give this dagger. The U active. You active. Passive. And then we put in M. We'll put in row. And we'll put in our daggers appropriately. Okay. So the act of transformation this is a transformation that you actually act on the quantum state. So we'll put U active. Is an active rotation of our quantum state. And then the passive rotation, you think that this is just rotating the basis, both cases, on the left and the right. It's what's happening there. So then we can just have this as some M tilde, some other M tilde, which is some new basis that it's been transformed into. And then we have some row prime as the outcome of doing this active rotation. Well, if this is our outcome after doing an active or passive rotation, you should note a few, few, few things of note here, that the passive rotation is happening to the measurement discourse. These are the events in which we're measuring, the events that are, these are the basis vectors that correspond to event M. And we can pass and rotate that set of events M. And if that's not uh, intellectually satisfying, just think we could permute those, those um, states M if you want to think of it inside of the language of our ordinary probability vectors. And the active rotation, again, as you can imagine this as a permutation or any other transformation, any other unitary transformation that just changes the basis of discourse. And M is changing the, measure, the basis of measurement. And so these two things you can uh, hopefully see already, but these two things cancel out if you want them to. You also note that they're moving in opposite directions, which is very much like you'd expect for an active and passive transformation of a vector space or a vector itself. And so this hopefully sits well about how we can transform uh, these states. Okay, active versus passive. You can also think another example that I'd like to give is that an active versus passive transformation that you can think of is diagonalizing rho. So quite often as quantum information scientists, we think of rho as being diagonalizable um, by some matrix that transforms you from one basis to the other. So in general, if we think about our density matrix, a probability density matrix instead of an arbitrary basis, we're gonna get coherences as well as um, populations. And so we can still think of the same row, not changing row at all, but just rewriting inside of another basis, inside of its eigenbasis, where it's diagonal. This is also a change of basis. However, this is a conceptual change of basis. You might not even do it. You might just talk about it theoretically, but this is still a change of basis to diagonalize the system. And so this is a very interesting change of basis to think about because you can think about um, how exactly you're doing this transformation. And so the transformation you would need in order to do this, is some unitary U that transforms to the basis pi J from EJ. So next time you think about the eigenbasis, think about whether you actually constructed the unitary or whether you just said that it exists. In the case that you said that it exists, that's very much a passive transformation. In the case you had to construct it and actually apply it to the matrix, that's very much an active transformation. Now the terminology is a little bit of a stretch here because we're not talking about actions inside of three space, we're really talking about diagonalizing matrices. Um, so 
this is, uh, I guess, to note this U lambda for the unitary that diagonalizes rho. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time. And just as a preview for what we're going to do next, hopefully it was a reasonably satisfying discussion of deterministic changes of basis. We'll go into next week or into Wednesday thinking about um, stochastic changes of basis. And what we'll do in the meantime is have our first lab. Our first lab will be looking at unitary transformations and um, We'll also be looking at our kinematics of a bit. And we'll see a little bit of the kinematics of a qubit just because it's appropriate for the lab. And we'll see some of the structure theorems of, of, of uh, qubits that we'll be using uh, and discussing in class um, tomorrow. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, yeah, look forward to seeing you guys at lab and I will talk to you on Wednesday.